of the Fallout series. I love the world that those games build, and consequently when I discover a work that is formulative to that universe, it tends to give that work a little bit of extra appeal to me. It's part of the reason why I like some of the later portions of The Martian Chronicles, and why I also enjoyed the film A Boy and His Dog, which are reviews for another time. The film we're reviewing today, Damnation Alley, is a little less known portion of this sort of subgenre of post-apocalyptic adventure fiction, 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 but it's still a remarkably enjoyable film. Damnation Alley opens with World War II being fought. The nuclear exchange happens, but in a scene that is almost chilling in its calmness. The world as we know it ends not with tension, stress, and fear, but with dead, calm people confirming their orders, flipping some switches, and confirming that the missiles have launched. Cut to several years later, the world is mostly inhospitable, and the crew of one missile base in particular is trying to figure out, well, what now? There are soldiers in the Air Force of a country that no longer exists, waiting around for orders that will never come, but because they're basically surrounded by death and desolation, there really isn't anywhere to go. Eventually, one of the officers at the outpost, Major Eugene Denton, played by George Papard of the A-Team, picks up a signal coming from Albany, New York, though sadly not Albany, Oregon. When a bis mishap makes the base inhospitable, Denton, along with two of his fellow officers, Tanner, played by Jan Michael Vincent of Airwolf fame, and Keegan, played by Paul Winfield of various green acting roles, including Star Trek II, go to Albany and try to find the source of the signal. Along the way, the group picks up two other survivors, Janice, who's played by French actress, actress Dominique Sanda, and young kid Billy, played by a, well, young Jackie Earl Haley of Watchmen fame. There's an interesting little bit earlier in the film for Fallout fans. The characters encounter rad scorpions, and this is in a film that came out in the 70s, so well before the earliest Fallout games. I'm assuming that this film and the novel, written by Roger Zelazny, were influential on the Fallout series of games. The film has two big things going for it. The first is the chemistry of the cast. Papard and Vincent have great odd couple chemistry. Vincent and Winfield really feel like close buds, and Vincent and Haley have a good sort of older brother, younger sibling relationship. Unfortunately, Keegan dies halfway through the film, and with Billy joining the film a little later, so their characters don't get to interact very much, so I can't see it, say how well they work together. Further, Sanda doesn't get any material in this film. She has two main scenes. One where she talks about what she did after the bomb drops, and one where, after the party finds a seemingly abandoned diner, she goes to play the piano. I don't know if this is an issue where the script simply didn't give her that much material to begin with, or if Sanda's English was low enough quality that it forced them to cut much of her material out of the script. The second big thing the film has going for it is the Roadmaster itself, the central prop of the film, a sort of segmented combination RV and armored personnel carrier. It's really well built and feels like the kind of vehicle you'd want to take across an apocalyptic wasteland, as opposed to, say, the War Rig and Mad Max, where it's the sort of vehicle that you have to take across an apocalyptic wasteland. It's got its own little bits of weirdness, like having a navigation computer where the prop is a Texas Instruments desk calculator. I describe the group as a party. This is in part because the film feels like a post-apocalyptic hex crawl tabletop role-playing campaign. In one hex, the party faces horrific storms, in another, killer cockroaches, and in a third, they roll a mechanical mishap so they have to take a detour to find spare parts. When one player character dies, a new character joins the party to replace the character that was lost and is introduced by the rest of the players finding another survivor holed up by themselves somewhere. It feels like, were syndication and content restrictions not an issue for television at the time, this would work perfectly as a 12 to 24 episode tele television series with a single season variety, with each episode being a new encounter for the crew of the Roadmaster. Instead, we have a film that is a post-apocalyptic road movie, which works well enough, but loses a fair amount of its tension due to the plot structure and its 90-minute runtime. It's a good rental, but it doesn't feel like a must-own, aside from the fact that this film got a Scream Factory release, and their standalone releases tend to have some really nice bonus features.
Once again, thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please like and subscribe to this channel. Subscribe and get you notified when future episodes come out. And liking lets me know that you enjoyed the episode. The video on the right will be of the previous episode of Nintendo Power Retrospectives, if you want to go see what I reviewed previously that on that show. And the video on the left will take you to the previous episode of Breaking It All Down, while well, you'll get to see what I covered there. And below that will be a link to my Patreon page if you wish to back the show. Backing the show can get you mentioned in the credits, and also, depending on your level of support, you can determine what I do future Let's Plays of on Breaking It All Down and what else I review on that show as well. So go ahead and click on that and back the show. Also, backing the show helps me get the show out more often and improve the production quality of the show, which is good for everybody. Once again, thank you very much for watching and see you next time.